Welcome to Passionate and Practical, The Art of Dreaming, Doing, and Serving. I'm your host, Lexi, and today I have a special guest on the show, Brooke Vanderit. She is amazing. She's a wife, mama, church planter, encourager, yoga instructor, and she is really just some someone that I have looked up to for a long time. Um, back when I lived in Central Florida, I attended Brooke and Renault's Church Mosaic in Central Florida, and just really uh, became the place where I fell in love with Jesus. And I really learned about the gospel and about Jesus and his character. And I was baptized in that church when I was 19. And it just is such a special place for me. So this episode is going to be really special for me just to get to chat with Brooke, um, who has been someone that I've really just looked up for, looked up to for a long time. So Brooke, thanks so much for being on the show. Sure. My pleasure. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, what are you passionate about? Um, I have a lot of passions. I'd say the first thing that really comes to mind just off the top of, you know, first of all, is just health and wellness has really been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember, probably since I was in college, just been passionate about fitness and taking care of our body just as, you know, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that includes physical exercise and what we put into it in terms of food, what we put on it and all the different, you know, lotions and creams and shampoos and just really trying to live a life that um, cares for this body that God has given us. Um, And then that has really over time evolved into kind of a bigger picture of not just nutrition and fitness, but really spiritual wellness and health and beginning. And you'll hear in a little bit just my journey and how that's come about, but just how everything is so connected in our lives that we can't separate our spirit from our body and our mind from our heart, that they're all related and integrated. And when one is not well, then it affects all the other areas in um, our being. And so my passion is really just trying to personally and as well as in my family and those I get a chance to interact with um, just to live as holistically and healthily glorifying God through all of it. That's beautiful. And I am a huge health advocate as well in a, in a holistic sense of I want people to be um, spiritually healthy, physically healthy, um, financially healthy, and um, that it's so true that there you can't have one without the others or if what if one is struggling then it kind of takes the rest down so um tell us a little bit more about you your family and a glimpse of this season of life okay well i am married i um my husband is renault we have been married for almost 23 years and we live in central florida in orlando we've been here since 2002 um We moved here in 2002 to start a church, Um, and so that our church is Mosaic Church and has just had our 17-year, 16-year anniversary. Um, We had two kids when we moved here, and then that grew to four, so I have um, birthed four children, and I say it that way because now we have eight children total. We've Hmm. also added to our family through adoption in 2012, so seven years ago, we brought um, a sibling group of four children home to be our part of our family from Ethiopia. And so now we are a family of 10. And um, that is a very over full time job, um, trying to manage and love and care for and all that that entails. Um, our family. So that's my main thing that I am kind of focusing on right now in my life. A lot of other side things going on, but that's the main thing. Um, this season is really a lot of just parenting a hundred miles an hour. We have our kids range in age from 21. Um, that's our son, Burhanu. He's still home and in, in um, high school, all of our adopted kids are behind academically because of just, you know, where they came from and not having, um, the same kind of educational background as you would have if you grew up here. So 
and they're all behind. So he's still in high school and we have a daughter who's away in college and then everyone else is still home. So our kids, like I said, range from 21 to 12. So we have a lot of teenagers in our home right now, which is, it's crazy. And I was in youth ministry for a long, long, long time and loved teenagers. (laughs) And now that they're all in my house, I'm like, I think I like being a youth pastor's wife better than being a mom to seven teenagers. (laughs) It's a little different Um, because the kids liked me when I was the, you know, when I was their youth worker. Now my kids don't like me very much because I'm going to all the time. But um, so it's a really challenging season. My kids are great kids. They all love Jesus, but they all think they know everything and Mm -hmm. nothing. So (laughs) we're working through that. As as I did when I was a teenager as well. Um, And that's when we met. So you've, you've seen a lot of change through my even my personal life. And um, so yes, this too shall pass. Um, And (laughs) and it's amazing that they're all um, following and loving Jesus. That is such a blessing. Um, So walk us kind of through the journey over the past 20 years, kind of from the conception of um, kind of God calling you guys from California to Central Florida, and what is the overview of what that process has kind of looked like? So um, we were in California. We were in youth ministry there, and uh, really was a great, um, great church, and things were going really well. We had a young adult ministry that was really thriving. We were loving working with the college students and kind of young career age um, you know, we were we were not that much older. I guess we were in our late twenties at that point, and um, just were loving it. But really felt like God was calling us to um, to start a church, which was crazy. We had never kind of thought that that would be part of our story. My husband, you know, at that time believed that he'd be in youth ministry until the day he died. And so when we felt this call to to plant a church, it was very unexpected. He had, didn't have a desire to be a lead pastor, but we. Um, I just started pursuing that and trying to figure out what does that mean? Where do we go? You know, we didn't have anyone kind of backing us or sending us out. So we just, we really came to central Florida. We felt like this was where God was calling us really because of Disney. We had a huge heart for Disney and recognizing Disney's impact on the Orlando area. And that it really defines Orlando as a city and it's in our culture. And so we, believe that if we came here and planted a church and started a church um, that eventually would grow and we'd be able to impact Disney as a whole, that we'd be able to see not just Central Florida change, but the nation and the world because of Disney's impact globally on our children um, through media and, and everything. And so that was really why we ended up in Central Florida. We, like I said, we came in 2002. We had sold our house and made some money in California um, we had two kids. Our daughter Hadley was um, almost three, and our son Cullen was five weeks old. Wow! And we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, we didn't go to like church planter school or have anyone supporting us or sending us, or we didn't even read a book. I mean, we nothing. We, didn't, mm-hmm. we were. I don't. I look back. And I'm like, what were we thinking? We literally that expression on a wing and a prayer was kind mm-hmm. of how we did it, which is not like me at all. But I think and I'll say it now, and it's kind of the theme for the last 20 years of our life and really our, our marriage and, and my walk with Jesus has just been, I have my plans, I have my dreams, I have my kind of, you know, my skill set and my passions, but yet God has a right and, and often does just trump all of those. And my desire is just to always say, yes, yes, God, whatever mm-hmm. you, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do. And so that was one of those, that was probably the first, probably second big time in our life where we were just like, this is crazy, but we're trusting you, God, and we're just going to lay it all on the line. And we don't know how it's going to turn out. There's really no guarantees, but we, we trust you and we're doing this for you. And so that's how we ended up here. And that's going to been a, been a recurring theme in our story ever since then, um, with the adoption, with some other, you know, ventures that we've kind of stepped into over the years have been like, this doesn't make any sense. Everyone would be like, this would be stupid. Why would you do that? Why would you throw that away? There's no security. You're going to ruin your life, you know? And we're like, but God said so, so we're going to do it. Um, And 
So we came in 2002 and we started the church. We really knew nobody. I mean, like I said, when we, we showed up, we met people in our neighborhood. We just were like, hey, you wanna, we're starting this church. You want to come? And, um, and it just kind of went from there. The first few years were really hard um, because we didn't have community. Hmm. You know, we had, we had every time we'd been in church before, we were going in as the youth pastor. We were already involved in a ministry. And so people were embracing us and wrapping around us. And now here we were kind of pioneering this work here and we didn't know anybody. We didn't have any family nearby. We had these two little kids. We, you know, we basically would just, we were living off of our savings account. That was not only our, our salary, but that was also all the money to start the church in the early days. And there was a lot of insecurity. And so it was really hard just that, like, right, did we hear God right? What's going to happen? What if people don't come? Hmm. What happens a year when there's no more money and our savings account runs out? You know, all those legitimate questions that, you know, and, and yet trying to trust and just keep walking by faith and not by sight. Um, and then I would say the other thing that was really amazing in those first few years was Renault and I, because we didn't have a team, we didn't have other people, we didn't have a core team or anything we had to work together and we are extremely different. I mean, if you could, you know, like the personality spectrum or is on one side and I am pretty much on the opposite <laughs> other side in every area. And, you know, it's kind of a lot of couples are like that. We definitely are like that. So, um, we, but we had to work together. Every decision we made, every meeting we had, we were in it together. And, and so that was a wonderful thing. I loved being involved. I loved being just in at the ground level on every decision and, um, you know, every family or every person that stepped into the doors of the church, we got to know and have coffee with them and have them over and they became our friends and this little fledgling community that we, um, you know, were birthing as we planted the church really became our family. And I think to this day, that's one of the things that makes Mosaic so unique and so different. And people say all the time when they come to our church, like I've never been in a, a church like this. And, and now we're a large church and it's not quite as obvious, but people still like can't put their finger on it. Something's different here because this is our family. It wasn't, this was never a job. This was never a, even it was, it was so much more than a calling. This hmm. was our life. Like hmm. there's no separation between pastor and congregant. It was right. just all of us trying to follow Jesus together. And, and that's been that way from the beginning. And, and that's how we still try to live our lives. Just part of the community Yes, this God has put us in leadership, but that doesn't make us better or more holy or more spiritual than you. It just is a matter of that's where God has us at this time. And so we struggle and we have the same issues you have and we're just trying to trying to do the right thing and follow God and honor him and as we parent in our marriage, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, just like you guys are. And so um, that's created a DNA and set a tone for our ministry mm -hmm. that I think is really unique. Um and has made it more of a family than some churches tend to be. So, yeah, it's really a powerful place. And, um, that's one thing that I love about the church is that oftentimes when Renault is speaking, he's sharing a story about family or the kids and how crazy it is to have eight kids. And he is not trying to share that it's all rainbows and butterflies. He's willing to be raw and honest. He's willing to share where he is struggling and um, you as well, just to be able to say, yeah, it's hard. Like it is really hard and living on mission stinks. And sometimes I want to give up. And I think that that does totally set the tone for the church and its authenticity in the way that it just truly is such a hospitable place, open door policy. Um, people are feel welcome there. And the crazy thing is, is that years ago, Renault's heart wasn't to have a huge church. And now it's kind of developed into a pretty we large church. Want big church. We wanted a small church. We'd come from big church and we were like so disillusioned. And we're right. like, no, 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 you know, we, which is so funny. Like, that's what I say. God has the right to trump any of our, because that was not our dream at all. We wanted small family. Everyone knows everybody. And now that's no longer the case, but yet God is still working in powerful ways. And it's just kind of said, trust me, just keep turning it over to me and I'll take care of it. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I think that's a huge 
difference maker from people who are striving. I We were um, a part of a church plant for about a year here, and um, there was just, I think, some definite sense of striving rather than just accepting of what God has given them um, as a a vision. And um, for me, just seeing the example that you and Renault were from the start when we, my family started attending, I think I was a freshman in high school and just being a part of a church that only had 30 families. And now, you know, 12 years later, it is, um, it's just incredible that most of the staff is the same. And in yep. usually in ministry, the turnover is two years, um, two to four years, I think. And just to see the same faces, it's just something so grounding about a place that even though um, when I come home to visit my family and we go to visit Mosaic, it's, yeah, I 90% of the people I don't recognize, but there's still the same people greeting and the same people um, that are giving the warmest hugs. And it's just, it, it really, really is a special place. And, and Renault's such a great communicator. And you've just been such an amazing um, supporter for him in this dream. But what, tell us a little bit more about your piece to play in it, because obviously, Renault as the lead pastor, we know his role. Um, but what was what has your role kind of looked like? And what has marriage looked like over the past um, 17 years? And um, how has God kind of used your different personalities for his kingdom? Okay, Whew. I'll see if I can remember all that. Um, <laughs> so look, at the beginning years, like I said, and I'll kind of go from there, we were doing everything together. We and it was, I loved that. And then we had more kids and the church grew and we were able to hire staff and things that I, you know, got to be a part of now I no longer was. And that was probably one of the, up to that point in my life. Now it's, it's gotten harder since, but little did I know it was coming later on, um, up to that point. So I'm now, you know, maybe in my early thirties, four kids, you know, all pretty young, all kind of kindergarten and under, um, I wasn't able to be as involved, you know, Mm. I'm now stay at home mom. I've, um, you know, taken care of these four kids and I've always taught fitness from when we first got married. So I've been, but that's always kind of just been a side thing I love to do and it's a passion, but it's not like a career for me. And so I've always just kind of taught three or four or five times a week at the gym, you know, on the side, but I've never seen that as a career. So, um, anyway, I started kind of having to just naturally, um, kind of step back from some of the different things I was doing at church. Still, we always have people at our house, always have groups over. um, You know, Renault and I are very relational, so we spend a lot of time hanging out with people. We try to be as many things as we can just because we love people and we don't want to be, we don't want that separation like, oh, well, you know, that's that's below the pastor. Like, they don't go to those kind of events anymore because the church is now this big. Like, mm-hmm. we try to just continually be involved and with the people and with everybody because that's, like I said, this is our family. And so, um, but that was hard for me. You know, I'm, I'm very much have a kind of a overachiever kind of personality. I'm very much of a go-getter. If I set my mind to something, I'm going to make it happen. And so now, you know, those first few years we were together, we were partners and now I've got these four kids and I just can't do everything I used to be able to do. And I went through a little bit of an identity crisis Hmm. during those kind of middle years where like, what exactly is my role? What's my place? Do you still value my input? You know, so a little bit of marriage, not like Rocky, but just, you know, I wanted Renaud to be like, oh, Brooke tell me what you think about this. What should I do? You know, he's now got other pastors and other staff that they're meeting with during the week and talking. And it wasn't that he was trying to leave me out. He just did. So, Mm -hmm. um, those were really, really hard. And I didn't know, you know, I mean, you, you know, you have a little one at home and about to have another one. And there's days when you're like, you just want adult interaction. You want someone to value what you have to say. Mm Mm-hmm to recognize that you have something to bring to the table because your kids don't recognize that, you know, when they're little and sometimes when they're old, they still don't. <laughs> but, um, and so I missed that. I missed, you know, having people seek out my input and my 
wisdom. I miss being part of those meetings and having a voice and um, had to kind of let that go for a little bit and realize that I was looking for validation in the wrong places. Not that it was wrong or was bad, but just that my, at this time in my life, my priority really had to be my children. And that was my first priority. And, and to do that joyfully and willingly, not, um, kind of with resentment or hurt that I was being left out of the, you know, church world. And, um, and that, so that was a good time for me. It was hard, but it was necessary for what was going to come later on. Just like I said, so we adopted these four kids. That was crazy. I would have never, ever thought I was have eight children. I mean, if you had talked to me in my early twenties, I mean, there was nothing in me that would have said, Oh, I want to have a big family. Oh, eight children. That sounds fun. <laughs> I didn't know anyone who had eight kids. I two, two sounded good. I was praying about three because Renault has three kids in his family of origin. So I was like, no, I don't know. Three sounds like a lot, mm -hmm. but I'll pray about it. <laughs> so eight was definitely not part of my, my plan for my life. And um, so when we, we went to Ethiopia in 2009 and I, um, we were there for a missions trip, not thinking about adoption at the time, although we had in our marriage at different times been like, oh, maybe someday we'll adopt, but had never pursued it. We were there. We were visiting an orphanage. We had been on many missions trips before that. We had been in many different third world contexts where we had been around, you know, kids who were, you know, in, in hard places. And for whatever reason, this one particular day and this one particular orphanage that we were visiting, we both simultaneously yet separately, we were on different sides of the room, just felt this connection to this little girl that we couldn't explain. That was uncanny, out of the blue. We couldn't stop thinking about her. Renaud's family was on the trip with us. His parents were, and his mother had the same sense of this one little girl. And we're like, what does this mean? Are we supposed to pursue her and figure out what her story is? And anyway, we ended up pursuing and deciding to try to adopt her. And as things unfolded, the story kept changing over and over again. At first she was an only, you know, she had no siblings. Her parents were no longer alive. And so we started the adoption process. We started the home study, all these different things from, you know, from America. And then as months went on, we realized that there was corruption in the orphanage and which is very common in, in third world context where mm -hmm. they're just trying to survive and they're just going to try to get money however they can. And, and so we discovered that she was not an only child and had three other siblings who were also in the orphanage. And at that time, you know, so we're now probably maybe three to six months into the adoption process. It still never crossed my mind that we would adopt four kids like, Oh, she has siblings. Okay. Well, we're not going to leave them there. So we had this grand plan that we would just, you know, Re Renault would use his incredible communication and inspiration <laughs> skills to um, invite others into the adoption story and we would find other families that would step up and adopt these siblings and they would all come and be part of our church and we would raise them as if they were, you know, cousins almost like we'd go on vacations together and they would live in the same neighborhood and they would visit, you know, hang out after school and do sleepovers. And that was, <laughs> that was our grand plan. Um, that plan changed as time went on and God just kept kind of working in our hearts and calling us to a bigger and bigger story. And we ended up, about two years in deciding that we needed to adopt all four of them. And mm -hmm. um, that was utter shock. And like, I, I remember terror, like, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm not equipped for this. It's, this is too big. God, I'm, I want to say yes, I will say yes, but I'm feel like I'm barely hanging on with the four kids I have, you mm -hmm. know, like I'm, I'm losing my mind some days trying to just parent the four that are, right in my home right now how in the world am I going to take care of eight and love eight and yet we you know just continued and ended up bringing all four of them home and I have to say I was totally we Renault and I were both completely unprepared I mean Renault is the it, optimist to the nth degree like there is no bad day for mm. Renault he finds the beauty and the good and the silver lining in every horrible situation, which is an incredible gift when you're in ministry, when you have to deal with people who are, 
you know, walking through all sorts of really, really hard things. And he brings hope to that table over and over again when he's sitting across from someone. And so I love that about him. I do not have that gift in the same way. Mm. And I, we brought these kids home and literally every single thing in our family changed. Everything. So we had been, had a family for 12 years. Our, our oldest daughter was 12 at the time when the other four came home. And everything that we had spent 12 years, 15 years since we'd been married, kind of building into our family, the rituals, the traditions, the the just philosophy of family and what does it look like to follow Jesus as a family and just our way, you know, every family has their way. None of that worked anymore. Nothing. All of it had to be dismantled. I mean, it wasn't even dismantled. It just crashed and burned. (laughs) I mean, it was, it was awful. (laughs) And at the time, you know, Mosaic is now considered an adoption church. We have a ton of families that have adopted and are fostering. But at the time, that was not the case. And there was a few families that had adopted a child or maybe two children, but none that had stepped into anything like we had. Um, That was just the magnitude of the story. And so I didn't really have support. And I was falling. I was dying. I literally, I, I can't think of that first two years that there was a day that didn't go by that I did not weep and mm. cry and want to walk out the door and never come back. Wow. And I say that and not with, not with any sort of pride. Um, I say that because I never saw it coming. I knew it was going to be hard and I had read books and I, had, you know, done all these different things and But it was just so, I I was so in over my head and there were so many needs and I couldn't meet those needs. And there was attachment issues. Um, If you know anything about the adoption world, that's fairly Mm. common and always happen where children that have, you know, had a disruption in their caregiver experience with their, you know, primary caregiver, mother and father, when there's disruption and then another caregiver is, comes into the picture, there's in their kind of deep psyche when it's not even conscious, there's an inability to trust, which makes perfect sense mm. in so that now there's this caregiver who's trying to show love and embrace and, you know, care for this child and is just being rejected over and over and over and over again in a million different ways. Wow. And so that happened in our family. Um, <clears throat> and no matter what I did, it just, like nothing seemed to work. We were, our family was just spiraling into a very dark place. And my husband couldn't, um, I think he couldn't allow himself to go to that dark place because it was too scary. And so he just kept trying to paint a silver lining and make everything okay. Um, Cause that's what he is so good at doing. But after months and years of it, of him trying to paint the silver lining and nothing really changing, I stopped being able to listen to him and be like, you just don't understand me. Like I'm dying here. And you're like, it's going to be fine. Next, yeah. It's going to be fine next month. Oh, next year it'll be fine. I'm like, we're three years in and I'm still dying. Yep. It's going to be fine. I'm not fine. I need help. And, um, so those were really the darkest times of our family and, um, not even of our marriage at that point for somehow we still managed to, for the most part, be on the same team when it came to parenting. Um, But it was really, really, really hard. And I did have a few friends during that time that had adopted around the same time. And so we would get together usually late at night. We'd get together at like 8 or 8.30 and we'd meet until like midnight. And we would just share stories and cry. And I think that kept me going, kept a little bit of my sanity just to be able to be real. And so I like we talked about earlier, just the authenticity and vulnerability that we've always tried to kind of bring to the table in our ministry. That I think for me was my saving grace. What kept me from truly losing my mind Mm. was having just a small group of people that I could just be like, I don't even know if I love these kids. Isn't that horrible? Like I, those thoughts crossed my head certain days. And, but like most people don't say those things And then it just leads to dark, deep shame Hmm. because you have these thoughts, you have these feelings and you know, they're not okay. And you're not proud of them, 
And so you stuff them and you hide them and you pretend everything's okay. And that's what most people do. And unfortunately, in most churches, that's what is kind of patterned, right? And that's what's right. modern. And, and I just knew that I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I'm just, I'm authentic and honest to a fault. Hmm. Um, and so I was so raw and so real with these small group of friends that I had to be able to just say, I'm dying. I don't even know if I, I want to walk away and I, I'm not going to, but I, that's what I feel like every day. And I cry every day and my hormones were out of whack. I was seeing a doctor, my, my stress levels. I started going into adrenal fatigue. I mean, it was when I say I, you know, like how one part of your life is out of balance, how it's going to affect all the others. I say that because I lived it because my body started shutting down in crazy ways because of the stress that I was under every day. Wow. Um, we haven't talked about the Enneagram at all. I'm a number one on the Enneagram, which is the reformer, which is the nice way to say perfectionist. Mm. Um, and what I've learned through this whole thing is that the inner critic in my head is so loud. Mm. And so during these years where every day I was just pouring out nonstop trying my hardest to just kind of keep our family together. I locked into like hyper control mode. Like I am going to make this okay. I, I am smart. I am strong. I'm a go getter. I don't give up. Failure is not an option. I'm just going to make, I can do this. And I would, everything I tried felt like it was just hitting my head against a wall. And so, um, that inner critic became louder and louder. Like you suck, Brooke, you can't do this. Who do you think you are? Like you're failing your kids. You're failing your husband. You'd say, you know, Jesus, you just scream bloody murder at your adopted daughter who needs you to love her. And you're screaming at her. That's the last thing on the planet that she needs. It would be better for them if you weren't here. Hmm. Those voices just speak on and on and on, day after day, week after week, month after month, convincing me that my family would be better off without me. So it was a hard time. I'm still here. I'm still in my family. I have not left. So we've made it past those really, really hard years. Um, we started, um, that's when really my soul care journey began. So I mentioned at the beginning, like my passion is just kind of holistic wellness and that really came out of this season in my life hmm. of recognizing that I was taking care of myself physically. I was eating all the right things. I was um, exercising still. Um, I was doing all the physical things to keep my body strong. But my spirit and my mind, there was war going on every day. And so I started this soul care journey um, discovered this ministry out of Colorado called the Potter's Inn that became just really a safe haven for me, a place where I could um, hear God and meet with God outside of the chaos of my home. Renaud and I went there years ago. We were maybe two years into the adoption. I can't remember exactly. And it's a time of um, a respite, of listening and being like, oh, okay, God does still speak. Because I, all I could hear were those voices that were telling me how terrible I was and what a failure I was. I'd stop being able to hear God's voice above that saying, I love you. I love you, Brooke. You are enough. You're enough because you're mine. And that's, that's enough. Um, and I'd lost the ability to hear that. And so going to Colorado and that kind of started this journey for me of I have to create boundaries in my life. I can't parent at the level I've been parenting, even if that means my kids aren't going to get all of me. Like I need to be, I need to take care of myself or I'm literally not going to make it. Hmm. Um, and so we bought three acres of property in, in central Florida and decided to come and build a home and kind of create this sanctuary for our family, for me, really, because I discovered that I connect with God profoundly through nature, and that's a way that God speaks to me really loudly and clearly, 
and I, um, where we were living, that just, it wasn't going to happen. Like I, I didn't have time to be like, Oh, let me just go drive to the lake for an hour. Like I didn't have an hour. I was, <laughs> I mean, just trying to manage my family and cook for 10 people every day that alone and doing laundry is a full-time job yes. times two, you know, yes. <laughs> and get and cart people to four different schools every day. My kids were in four different schools, four different schedules, four different cities, four different ca- school calendars. It was crazy. Um, and so we bought this property really as a, to turn into a sanctuary. Um, and it's, it's still a work in progress, but it's been a passion of mine to, to, um, just create a space for myself and for my kids and for my family and for anyone who wants to come to meet with God and to be able to just be still and listen and breathe and watch butterflies and reflect on his word. And so that's really become a passion for me. It goes against my nature because I'm like, go, 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 check it off, get it done, work harder, push through. And God's saying, uh, it's just wooing me back to him and saying, mm. that's okay. I've made you that way. And, and that's a great thing. And you get a lot done and you do a lot for me, but I just want you to enjoy me right now. Like I want just to enjoy you. Can we just be together? And so that's kind of where he's been calling me into these last few years. It's not easy. It's a choice. And sometimes I make it and sometimes I don't. I very regularly fall back into work, achieve, get it done. Mm. But I look out my window and I see my butterfly garden and my organic vegetable gardens and my beehives and my prayer shed and my prayer trail. And I'm like, okay, no, no, I need to be with, I need to be with God. That's more important. Mm. My soul needs to find, be reminded of who I am in Christ. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to that place of I'm not enough. I can't do this. I'm in over my head. I want to give up. And so, whew, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> it's it's an, an amazing story and just such a fantastic example of just the simple truths that God wants our hearts. He wants us to love, serve, follow him, and he wants us to love our neighbors. And beyond that... We don't really have much on our to-do list. And I think that today's society, especially in America, we are the striving for success country. We, I mean, in South America, they do siesta. In um, parts of Europe, they, you know, they have breaks throughout the day. It's, It's just, for us, we are the consumers and we have the all stimulation, um, especially in central Florida where every billboard is, um, come to the happiest place on earth, or it's, it's kind of this, uh, false reality of a world. Um, cause it's saying here, come and, and be the, come to this place and there's no worries, no cares. And it's, it's an amazing place, but it's still so much just overstimulation. Um, so one thing that has been a kind of this theme throughout the past, um, several weeks for me has been people that are just pointing me to rest in God's heart rather than, uh, striving. And I think in ministry, it's so easy to turn the ministry is received, not achieved card in for, I'm going to, I'm going to go get this for myself. God's given me the vision. Now it's time for me to make it happen. And oftentimes he gives us more than we can handle. There's like this quote that is totally not biblical that says, God never gives you more than you can handle. And that's such a lie. He gives us more than we can handle because we have to rely on him. And it's just, it's such, such a great reminder that for you being, um, the reformer on a a one on the Enneagram. Um, my husband is a three, which is the achiever, um, which has a lot of similar. I'm like, right. It's, I could probably go either way, but I kind of reformer edges out three just a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. So he's the achiever, which he is constantly looking for the next thing to, Mm -hmm. um, 
to achieve, to really, to, um, the mountain, the next mountain to climb. And I'm an eight, which is, um, the challenger. And so for me, um, seeing people, uh, achieve, seeing people do their best and kind of being that champion, that is a big part of who I am. So part of that is like, if I'm encouraging someone to go after their big, bold dreams, then I better be doing my thing too. And so it's just this kind of this crazy cycle that just keeps encouraging, um, striving and God just wants us to rest. And a couple weeks ago, you and Renault had this amazing live, um, video that Mosaic's been doing these kind of uh, lunchtime type uh, live videos on Facebook. And I watched the one that you and Renault talked about Sabbath. And so how would you encourage a young family that's living in America today that has a lot on their plate? Maybe mom stays home. Maybe she works. Maybe um, dad has two jobs. Maybe they have one kid, maybe they have five kids, but what is kind of this theme of rest that you wish someone would have just shook you earlier on and just said, slow down? How, how do you drill that message in and how does someone truly adopt that? I think Sabbath is just this incredible gift. And I think you know, the church has gotten it wrong. (laughs) One, most churches, I mean, in most kind of our Western you know, American Christian church, evangelical church, most people do not follow or keep the Sabbath in any sense of the word. And it's a tragedy in my mind. Um, Mm -hmm. Really, the Sabbath is a gift from God to us. He knows how desperately we need rest. But even more than that, it's not even about the rest. It's how quickly we forget God and we make ourselves God's. And we make our lives about us and not him. And so Sabbath, God made Sabbath for man to remember, just like we take communion to remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We stop and we rest to remember that God is our provision. We are not our provision. Hmm. God is our provider. And so back in the day when they, you know, in the time of the Israelites and and God instituting the 10 commandments and the law and the whole book of the law, like when they took an entire 24 hour period of rest, I mean, it literally was like their livelihood stopped for those 24 hours. They were farmers. They were, you know, nomads traveling in the wilderness. Like they, to stop for 24 hours, like, was crazy, you know, and yet God was telling them, I'll provide, I'm your provider, trust me, wait on me. And he's saying the same thing to us now, like, stop, stop working, enjoy me, enjoy this life that I've given you, enjoy your husband, enjoy your children, stop doing the laundry, (laughs) stop running the vacuum, stop paying the bills, stop trying to get that other those emails done, get off the phone, put Mm. the social media away, like enjoy the people I've given you and enjoy me. And it's amazing. Like what it does, it's like an entire reset and it's, and God knows we need it every single week. It's not enough to do it. We forget so quickly. And how many times have, I mean, I know I've done this where I start my morning. I'm, going to read the Bible. I'm going to spend time with the Lord. And by 11 o'clock, I'm like, uh, what did I read again? I know it was really good. Mm. No, I mean, three hours later, I can't remember Mm. the passage I studied at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, because I'm, my brain's by then already done a hundred different things. I'm already going in so many different directions by 11 o'clock in the morning. And so God is saying, no, take a whole day. We're not at a whole day. We don't even do it every week, but we are pressing in and we're not giving up. My, like I said, my husband doesn't ever sit still. So Sabbath, the idea of Sabbath to him is kind of a little bit like torture. Um, <laughs> but but he's, he's pressing in too. He's trying. Um, whereas me, I'm like, oh, rest. That sounds heavenly. Um, but so we're continuing to press in on, you know, we, we haven't done 24 hours our family dynamics are very challenging because of the personality um, dynamics between all of our kids and us. Um, it's not always pretty. 
And so we just do a few hours. When we when we do it, we do a few hours. We do four hours, six hours that we block out. We tell the kids a couple of days ahead of time, this is what we're going to be doing. So there's, they already know it's, so we don't like kind of surprise them like, oh, guess what? It's out of time right now. Mm-hmm. And you know, so, which is a big deal when you have seven teenagers. So, yes. um, <laughs> and so we kind of prep them ahead of time and we try really to keep it simple. We try to do something together as a family that is connecting us with God mm-hmm. at our kids level. So maybe that's a video that we watch and then we discuss. Maybe we do something called Lectio Divina, which is this incredible way to interact and listen to God through his scriptures. And we found that our kids can engage in that. And it's a really powerful and beautiful thing. So we might do that together. And that might be 30 minutes. It's not like we're going to sit and read the Bible and study the Bible together as a family for two hours. Like we're just setting ourselves up for disaster if we do that. You know, yeah. so we're lower the bar, keep it simple. One spiritual activity where we are connecting with each other. Maybe we, you know, we each put a prayer request in a little bucket and then we draw one out and we take, we go around the circle and we pray for each other. I mean, sometimes it might be just as simple as that. And then we do some sort of special meal together where there's a little bit of a ritual that we, you know, maybe we light a candle or we say a special prayer at the beginning, a Sabbath prayer. And we have a special dessert because dessert's kind of a treat in our house. We don't have dessert every day. And so we, you know, I'll make a special dessert for Sabbath meal. And then we do something fun. We just do something fun where the point is just to laugh and enjoy each other. And maybe that's a game of tag. That's been some of our most fun times that we've had, just getting out in the front yard and playing tag together, when we, and which is quite hysterical um, with all the different you know personalities, like I said. Or maybe it's just going for a walk and we go and we look for butterflies and caterpillars and birds and we just kind of go on a nature walk. I mean, it, and we just try to spend time together where our focus is on the Lord and on each other. And mm-hmm. it's that simple. And so I would say start somewhere. If you can't take a whole day, start somewhere, but plan it. It's not going to happen unless you plan it. Mm-hmm. Sit down on a Sunday night. Look at your week together with your spouse and say, okay, here's our gap. Maybe it's not the same time every week, although that would be ideal to set that pattern into place. Sometimes that's not possible if you don't have a you know, standard work schedule that's the same week after week after week. But say, okay, we've got a gap. Sunday afternoon from 2 to 7 p.m. Nothing's going on. There's nothing on the calendar. Okay, we're going to keep that clear. We're not going to schedule anything. We're not going to have people over. All right, what are we going to do? Maybe we, maybe on Saturday then you cook ahead of time so that you're not spending an hour and a half cooking dinner. You know, like they require some planning. But it's so worth it. Just start somewhere, start small, and it is a gift. It is a gift that God has. I love the just the heart behind how your family does Sabbath, and I love the absence of legalism. I think that that is also something that Mosaic has done so well, is just anything that could possibly be legalistic, it's always tried, and there's always a challenge behind it, and it comes back to the heart. So if we are going to do this thing that God has asked us to do, let's make sure that we're not falling into a pattern of doing it and showing up and being obedient just for the sake of doing it because God said so. Um, I love that you, um, the church just stands for something so much more. It stands for freedom. I would say that's like the overarching theme of mm-hmm. Mosaic is just pointing people to the freedom that is in Christ. And that's what I hear when I hear you talking about this. And I, I um, was just in small group today and we were just talking about how Sabbath, it it may just be the very thing that Christians can be countercultural in. Um, there's, I mean, there's lots of ways we can be countercultural, but today we need it more than ever. We are attached mm-hmm. to our phones. We are attached to social media. We don't unplug. We don't, uh, we fill our calendars. We fill every night of the week, plus the weekends, plus ministry, plus parenting, plus, you know, adding a few hours here and there to work, whether it's because we need extra money or because we're just striving for the next promotion. I mean, it is just nonstop. And one thing I love, Um, I'm a big fan of Bob Goff and he talks about quitting something every Thursday. And I think that's so fantastic because we are, as adults, we're constantly adding to our plate, but we're not constantly looking at our plate and saying, what's not working in this season? And it is so 
um, the reminder of, you know, when you had little ones at home and you kind of had to take a step back from ministry or just it, your role just looked different. It wasn't that you weren't ex- existing. It was, and, and sometimes it feels that way when we have to, um, it, it's like our heart kind of stops when we have to, for me last season, um, or last fall, I was sitting on a board of a ministry I loved so much and having to roll off the board was such a tough decision, but I knew my soul, my family, and the ministry needed me to make space for someone who could work harder and and, and do more in that season. And so it's just such a great reminder uh, to rest. And so what are um, some resources that you have personally um, seen work well and also um, just as we close, maybe just tell us a little bit about holy yoga and how, um, and what that is about. So I, um, I'll start with holy yoga. I, like I said, I've been a fitness instructor for a really long time, all different kinds of classes and, you know, a gym setting and a secular setting. And then when things kind of got so hard in our family, I started subbing some yoga classes at my gym, again, secular setting. And, it was hard for me. I, not that I mean, the yoga was hard, but really the, the s- slowness and the quietness of the space was the, probably the hardest thing for me. I found that my brain never shuts down hmm. until my head hits the pillow. I do sleep really well at night, but all day long, my head is just like, you know, like thoughts, do this. Don't forget that. Call this person. What's for dinner? Oh, stop by and get that. Did you drop that off? Permission slipped, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so when sitting in that yoga class when I was subbing and having to like lead a meditation at the end and then be silent for like three whole minutes was crazy. Three minutes felt like three hours. And I realized something is wrong. Like the fact that I can't just do nothing and not think about anything for three whole minutes means I'm way too amped up. You know, like there's way too much going on in my head right now. And so it became this kind of journey for me to learn how to be okay with stillness and to be okay with silence and to just breathe. And I have been so fascinated with breath over the last few years. This is another gift that God has given us, This that our breath is a reminder that he is our sustainer. So when you breathe deeply, like when you actually stop and have to take a really deep breath, you can't think about 500 other things. You can literally only think about one thing at that time. And so for me, it's been this gift of God just inviting me into a space of saying, I'm sustaining you. Slow down. Breathe. Just think about me. And so that's kind of where yoga started for me, just this need to be able to be still and to quiet the noise in my head. And I had really started loving it and wanted to pursue a certification, but I didn't want to spend hundreds of hours getting certified with an organization that I was going to be exposed to maybe a lot of different teachings that I might not agree with. Hmm. Um, and so I kind of put it off, put it off, put it off. And then two years ago, a friend of mine told me about Holy Yoga, which is a Christian nonprofit ministry that trains, you know, instructors to become yoga instructors with the emphasis and focus being on Jesus hundred percent through and through. And I was like, hmm, that could be really interesting. I don't know, though. Maybe I started pursuing it and researching and and really discovered that it was biblically sound and gospel centric and started kind of getting asking a lot of questions and took a class from my friend and, and loved it. And so I got my certification. It's a 225 hour certification um, about a year and a half ago. And it was really life changing. It Basically, I would say the best way to describe holy yoga is worshiping God, heart, mind, soul, and strength. Hmm. It is coming onto your mat and bringing your whole self, your spirit, your body, your mind, all of it, and saying, here I am, God. I want you. I want more of you. And God has just met me really powerfully and profoundly through my time um, practicing holy yoga, teaching holy yoga. It's worship, it's prayer, it's scripture, there's teaching. It's kind of like kind of like going to a Bible study, but you don't have to study the Bible. It's just receiving. It's just like, here I am, and God just pours his spirit over you. And it's really beautiful, and 
refreshing and freeing and healing. It's been a really healing space for me, and I've seen it to be a really healing space for the people that have come to my classes. So we now offer some classes at our church, which is really, really awesome. Um, the church has opened the doors for us to be able to do that there. And um, people finding freedom and healing in their bodies, that whole mind-body connection, where there's a book. This is an incredible resource. Um, it's not a Christian book, but if you have any um, interest in learning more about trauma and how our body stores trauma, it's called The Body Keeps the Score wow. by Bessel van der Kolk. And it's an amazing book. It was actually one of our required books for um, – I did a trauma-sensitive yoga training as well, and that was one of the required readings. But it is just this powerful way that God has designed our bodies – and our brains really that when things happen to us, it is imprinted in our body, in our brain, in our neural pathways, in our bodies. And many of us try to deal with it only through cognitive mental ways. But a lot of times you can't even go there cognitively when there's that much hurt and pain. So think about perhaps someone who was, you know, abused as a child and has really never dealt with that, and it, but it's affected their how, how they can trust in their relationships and how they see the world and how they see themselves. And But all of it's kind of at this subconscious level. And I'm, like I said, I'm living that because of the children that I brought into my home. I'm seeing that day, on, day after day, how trauma has affected their view of the world, their view of themselves, their ability to relate to others. And so, but many of us can't even go there intellectually. Like it's too deep, the pain is too much, and we can't, our brains have shut down there to be able to access that trauma cognitively, but we can access it physically. Hmm. Through, like, I mean, yoga is one way, there's lots of, but exercise, where we're unlocking these places in our body that have been storing these deep hurts, and that unlocking physically then leads to the ability to unlock emotionally and cognitively. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I was just talking to someone who is speaking about a breathing exercise that is um, maybe something you're familiar with. I forgot what it's called, but she said um, she's she's doing some retreat hosting um, and they do this breathing exercise. And she said some of the reactions that people have, some of it is hysterical laughing some of it is just weeping and weeping and some of it is just there's just some strange kind of things that come from it so that makes total sense and it's just amazing to know that this is all connected and that we um I think so often as the church, we are letting people down when we just say, go pray about it. You know, you're, you're depressed, go pray about it. Or you're anxious, go pray about it. it. Just say this Bible verse 10 times and you'll feel better. Right. Right. Um, and, or like, I'm praying for you. It's like, that's a good start. Absolutely. But how do we go deeper? How do we, um, invest in our friends? How do we check up on them? How do we, you know, how do we sit with them in pain? Sometimes we have a, a, um, we're, it's like a time ticker basically for someone's pain and we only have patience for them for a season. And then we're like, okay, it's time for them to get over it. Um, and so there's just, I think that way a lot too, like, okay, you've been grieving for a year now. I think it's time to move on, you know, and there's really no timetable. Like it's different for every single person and it comes in waves and then it recedes. And I think our whole journey, our spiritual journey is like that, you know? Amen. And yeah, it's just a, a beautiful example to just be so promoting of rest and holistic well, wellness alongside the gospel. It's not replacing, it is alongside. And I think that that is where true healing and true um, restoration and um, rest takes place. Because when we only um, subscribe Bible verses, we are cheapening the other things that God has given us as tools. Um, and then if we only 
share, you know, if you change your diet and I, I was on this train a few years ago, I had these crazy health things and issues and I adopted a gluten-free diet and since then have really, really changed my lifestyle. And, um, I was preaching gluten-free diets to everyone. I was like, you have this ailment, gluten-free diet. If you have this ailment, gluten-free diet. And then I realized, okay, calm down, Lexi, like it does not cure everything. But um, yeah, there's just, there's a beauty in in the rest, in, in what eating whole foods and exercising in a way that just pr- promotes healing from even trauma, which is just fascinating. Um, wow. Well, I could seriously talk about this all day. It's been something that God's really put on my heart and I'm going to just speak it out loud because I don't know what, when it's going to happen, but um, I was doing this goal setting journal at the beginning of the year and it asked like, what, what, what do you and your spouse want to be doing when you're 80? And I could only picture a retreat center. Like I could just, that's all I can think of. I don't need a fancy car, a fancy house. I don't need any of the things that a lot of, um, the American dream is saying and setting up for it's, I just want a place where marriages can be restored and people can rest and people can, you know, just experience being in nature. And I'm not very good at being in nature, so I don't know how God's going <laughs> to, God's going to help me in that area. But, um, I, I just really love the, my prayer girl when you're back in town. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm all, I'm all over it. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, I really feel like God's putting on my heart, um, just kind of the sense of restoration and how do we, um, and how it, for for me right now, like hospitality is a huge part of my heart. And so how do I create a home that is restful and restorative for people? So Brooke, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been such a pleasure to chat with you and just hear more of your story and how God's just been working in your heart over the past several years and um, just this incredible place that he's brought you to. Thank you. My really, it's been an honor. I'm just so thankful and looking forward to see what God does with all of it. So, Yay. Well, ladies, you are infinitely valuable. You were created with a unique set of gifts, skills, and talents created by God for his purpose and his glory. So go be his hands and feet to this broken world. Get it, girl. much for taking the time out of your day. If this message has encouraged you, then please click to subscribe and share with a friend who may be inspired by the message. Also, if you have an event coming up and you're looking for a speaker, click the link below to get in touch with me.